chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, said Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd the flock, shepherd the sheep. Verse 17, and he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved, and because he said to him, the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. That's the scripture reading for this morning. Brother Bourne will be preaching on that. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Righteous Father, come before you now, thanking you for this day, the opportunity of the blessing of assembling ourselves together to worship you, the one and only true living God. I'd like to pray for those of our number that have been mentioned that are dealing with illnesses on a daily basis, especially for Brother Lewis's dad. He's a minor former member here. He's still a member here. Pray that you'll bless him, bless the Lewis, the Williams family, that what's being done for his daddy will benefit him, that he can regain his health and, his, and get his sugar stabilized on him. Pray for Jeanette Hooper being diagnosed with COVID. We know this is a bad thing to have. Pray that you'll bless her and her family as they deal with this. Father, we pray that you'll bless each and every one of us, keep us safe, always in your watchful care. We realize that you are the one and only true living God. You control this world that we live in. You created it for us. Pray your blessings be upon us as we go about doing what we need to do. Help us to always understand that we are Christians. We should be working and worshiping you on a daily basis as we should. Pray that you'll bless us in our worship service this morning as we commune with Remember Jesus Christ and your death upon the cross. Remember that he suffered and died on our behalf, that we could have hope of eternal life and home in heaven if we are only meeting to your will. Pray that you'll bless us as we go about, as we do to our service this morning. All we say and do will be in accordance with your will, with reverence and all. These things we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. I apologize for the delay getting song service started. I lost my song list, so be with me. Uh, 383, 383 to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. As I've always said, let's sing with the spirit and understanding to prepare our minds for this supper with the Lord. 383. Up we come together, up we sing and pray, here we bring our offering on this holy day.
I'd like to read with you Hebrews, the 11th, ninth chapter, rather, beginning in verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and of cows, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having have obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. I can compare this passage to Acts 4 and verse 12 where we're told that in no other name is there salvation other than in Christ. As we partake of the Lord's Supper to remember that Jesus died for us. Our redemption, our salvation was only possible by the Son of God coming into this world and experiencing this horrific death, the anguish and pain, so that he could pay for our sins and to shed his life blood to die for us so that we might be redeemed through that blood. This time we want to observe the Lord's Supper partaking of the, the bread first. If you bow with me, please. Our Holy Father and our God in heaven, we offer our praise to you a God of love and mercy and grace, and we're awed by the fact that you gave your Son to die for us. And we're so thankful that the Lord Jesus himself was willing to go through that agony and pain specifically so that we might have redemption, that we're children of God by that sacrifice. We have hope of eternal life by that anguish that he suffered. We pray, Father, we thank you for this bread that we can now partake of that discerning that body, and we pray that we do there with all reverence. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Also, we also want to, according to the pattern, offer a prayer uh, in preparation for the taking of the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, we approach thy great throne of grace again, still with awe, still with reverence, knowing that you have given your son to die for us, and that, and that Jesus shed his blood that redeems us, that washes away our sins, and brings us into the fa family of God. May we partake of this, remembering that blood shed for us, and that may live our lives in accordance and we may be edified by this occasion. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Not only were to observe the Lord's Supper and our worship according to the first century pattern, but also we're to make an offering unto God. First Corinthians 16th chapter tells us to lay by in store. So, and so we, this is time. Of course, we're not taking up a collection plate, but we have a box in the rear of the, rear of the auditorium where you could put your contribution. But we'd like to have a prayer on behalf of that. If you bow. <laughs> our Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your blessings. We know that every good and perfect gift of life is given to us by you. And we know that every spiritual blessing heavenly places is ours in Christ Jesus. As we think of how blessed we are, Father, we, may, we pray you'll touch our hearts that we may give in a generous way, not grudgingly or of necessity, but out of, out of love and reverence for you and thanksgiving for how you've blessed us. And with the determination that we want to be a... a financial part of the Lord's work. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
616. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall never suffer the gates of to help us prepare our mind for our prayer that's coming up. I would like for you to stand for the prayer and remain standing for the song after the prayer. Have thine own way, Lord. Mold me and make me do all those things that need us to help us to be better Christians. Let our thought process go through this prayer that we will have by this song direct our mind in that avenue. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way.
May we pray, please? Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together as a group of Christians and worship you on this Lord's Day. We thank you, dear Lord, for this building that you have provided us with through our material blessings to be able to have comfort in this. Father, we thank you for this great nation that we live in where we can worship you oppressed and Lord, please be with America. Father, now at this time, we would pray for the widows and the orphans of this world. We pray for the little ones, Lord, that are being born every day without someone to love them. If you will, please, Lord, provide for them someone to love them and let them know and feel that love. Father God in heaven now, we would ask that bless the missionaries of this world that go about spreading your word in the face of danger. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the military, especially those that are overseas. We pray that they may come home to their families at the end of their tours safely. Praying, Heavenly Father, constantly for your word to be spread throughout this whole world, to each little nation, to each little island that may never have heard of you, Lord. May you Grant us the ability to help in that respect. Praying, Heaven, Heaven, Father, constantly for the sick and the afflicted, that you may lift them up and be with them, be with their family and their caregivers, be with their doctors, Lord. May they be able to help those that are in need. Praying, Heavenly Father, now for those that are homeless, those that are hungry and have no shelter, that you can provide for them, Lord, as only you can. Because, Lord, you are our shepherd. We are your sheep. Please lead us on, Lord. Father, now we would ask that Brother David be allowed to have the words to teach us your ways. Lord, we thank you so much for Gary leading songs of praise to you. Now, please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings, Lord. Through your, it's through your Son, Jesus Christ, we ask this prayer be lifted up to you. Amen. Five, three, eight. Five hundred and thirty-eight. We'll sing verses one and four. Five, three, eight. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but holy lead on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is Seven, why keep Jesus waiting? Brother David, we welcome you. Good morning. With today being Valentine's Day, a national holiday in which we celebrate love. This morning, we're going to center our discussion, our thoughts on the grand subject of love. And in preparing this lesson, 
uh, it became necessary to break it up into two parts. The original plan was to uh, complete it this evening, but if the good Lord wills, we'll look to complete it next Lord's Day Monday morning. But the question is, what is love? That's what we're going to be looking at. The Bible clearly teaches that anything we do in the area of bringing people to Christ is to be motivated with love. The Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4 verse 15. He says, teach the truth, speak the truth in love. Uh, and, and, and so the question is, what is love? Henry Drummond said that love is the greatest thing in the world. And I think many of us would just readily agree. Bible students are quick to look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, where Paul, through inspiration, says, And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. So we would agree love is the greatest thing in the world. But the question again is, what is love? You know, as New Testament Christians, we believe that, that love will solve many of the problems in the world today. Love would solve many of the problems in the church. Love would solve many of the problems in our families. And love will truly complete things and, and satisfy things and, and uh, help us to grow as, as individuals. But again, what is love? You know, compared to Koine Greek, and I know that that may uh, be an, in, uh, an unfamiliar term, uh, Koine Greek, that is a language. Koine Greek was the language in which the New Testament was penned. It was written in Koine Greek. And the, the significant thing about that is, is we know that language over time has a pattern of evolving. It has in the English language. Uh, for, in, uh, for instance, you take the word sick. Uh, years ago, it simply meant that that's somebody under the weather. But now, determined, uh, determined by context, sick could very well mean that's cool, that's awesome. And, and so words have a, have a tendency to evolve, to, to change in meaning with the passing of time. But Koine Greek, not so. Why? Because it's a dead language. It's no longer spoken. And so Koine Greek, when you have the New Testament written in Koine Greek, what it meant in the first century, so those words mean in the 21st century. They did not change over time. But when you compare to Koine Greek, the English language is poverty-stricken. We really have a poverty-stricken language. And the subject this morning is love. Well, in the English language, there is only one word for love. And this one word, love, is uh, the wife is to love her husband, love her family, love her house. Love her new car, her new dress, her pet bo boxer. Yes, that's a beautiful dog. <laughs> but there's one word. It's all the same word. And, and, and love is used in our society to mean everything from the most uh, flippant emotion to a deep giving relationship. So that's what we're saying when we're talking about Compared to Koine Greek, the English language is poverty-stricken. Now, why do I say that? Because Koine Greek has four words for the word love. Koine Greek has four words for love, and, and the word used depends on the particular shade of meaning that one wants to express. And those four Greek words are agape, phileo, Eros and storge, those four words. And again, whichever of those four words you used in Koine Greek was determined by what exactly you wanted to say. Uh, and, 
And so this morning, we're going to investigate these words in light of the New Testament. As an example, the different usages of the word love. Uh, let's look at our text there in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. On the night before the betrayal, the Lord predicted that his disciples would forsake him. But good old Peter, bold, impetuous, courageous Peter, he tells the Lord that if even if all the disciples were to forsake you, I most certainly will not. I'm not going to forsake you. Uh, and we see that there in, in Mark chapter 14, verse 29, Luke chapter 22 and verse 33. But by early morning, we're talking about the very next day. We're talking just a, a matter of a, a few hours from when Peter made that bold and, and strong statement. That next morning, Peter had denied Jesus three times. He's no longer the, the rock of, uh, of strength that he thought he was. He's no longer that, the tower of strength and courage that he thought himself to be. And you remember what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Let him who, who stands take heed lest he fall. Again, that's 1 Corinthians 10 12. We know in Revelation, or not Revelation, the book of Romans chapter 12 and in verse 3, Paul said uh, uh, for, a man, for a man not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. We think about what Peter said, what Peter did, and these words of the Apostle Paul. It's very interesting uh, when, you, when you look at these things that, that, that Peter's actions show that his commitment to the Lord was none superior than that of the other disciples. Now, it's very interesting also to see what our Lord's command to Simon Peter was. First, it was, feed my lambs. And then he said, tend my sheep. In other words, what Jesus was telling Peter is, you must recognize your responsibility to teach and to care for the young and for the old. For the spiritually immature and the spiritually mature. That's really, in essence, what Jesus was telling Peter. And, and, and that, brethren, is our responsibility as well. But the passage contains here two of the four Greek words for love. It contains agape and phileo. Now listen to what happens. When Jesus first asked Simon Peter... He said, do you love me more than these? He used the word agape. He used the word agape. And agape is, is something that suggests a, a high order of reverence, a high order of respect. Uh, when you talk about agape, agape is subject to command because it is a mental decision. You have a choice to make as to whether to obey the command or not. Agape is a mental decision. It's subject to command. That's the type of love that, that we're to have for our enemies. You don't necessarily feel affectionate towards your enemies, but Jesus and, 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 and the inspired uh, scripture is telling us that we are to agape our enemies. Make the mental decision to love our enemies. Well, that question, no doubt, brought to Peter's mind his weakness, his shortcomings. The mental decision, Peter, Peter, Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? And uh, Peter responds, uh, he responds with the word phileo. That word is, is something that uh, results from kinship or close association. When you think about phileo, it's that which promotes a, a warmth of affection. It's the affection, uh, love, the emotion, love. And... Uh, it's not subject to command. 
Because you can't command a genuine emotion. So agape is a mental decision. It's subject to command. Phileo is not. Now, all uh, we, we, we see here that, in essence, Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know, I phileo you. What is he saying? Peter is telling Jesus, Lord, I do not love you because it is commanded. I love you sincerely and genuinely from my heart. The second time Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Again, he used the word agape. And again, in response, Peter uses that warmer, more humble word, phileo. And again, he's saying that his love for the Lord is not based on command. It comes from the heart. So now the third time Jesus asked Peter, he said, do you love me? And he used the word phileo. In other words, Jesus is now turning to Peter and said, Peter, you used, responded to me twice with phileo, a tender, affectionate term for me. Now Jesus is saying, do you truly? Do you truly have that warm, close, personal, abiding love that you claim? You remember, Peter? You remember how in the moment of, of weakness you denied me? That you were far off when I was being tried? Without doubt, you know that struck his heart. But Peter, recalling his awful mistake, is given the opportunity to reaffirm his deep abiding love for the Lord. He denied him three times, yes. But our text here in John 21, 15 through 17 says he was able to reaffirm his love, not once, not twice, but three times. This morning, we want to begin our discussion by talking about agape. What is agape? The word agape is most frequently, is the most frequently used word for love in the New Testament. It's used approximately 250 times. That's how often we see agape or a form thereof found in the New Testament over about 250 times. Agape is the great commandment. You remember what Jesus said when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said what? Matthew 22, beginning in verse 37. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What is he saying? You shall agape the, the, the Lord your God. And then he said, the second is like it. You shall agape your neighbor as yourself. So we're love. We're to have agape love for both God and man. First and second greatest commandment, love God and man, agape. All of our actions, all of them are to be motivated by this kind of love, by agape. Now, when you think about it, when when a wife fixes food for a husband, she may throw it at him, and he may be able to eat it, but that's not going to be a demonstration of agape. (laughs) And when the wife is, or or the husband is maybe constantly late uh, for a good meal and doesn't have enough respect to call uh, his wife that he's going to be late, that's not agape. And we'll describe that, we'll we'll make make that uh, clear in in just a moment. Take your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, is the, the chapter of love. Now, what you may or may not know is chapter. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 are talking about spiritual gifts. Gifts that were in existence. These are miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit that were in existence during the first century. Chapter 12 talks about the the different uh, uh, miraculous gifts in existence. It names them. Chapter 13 deals with the duration 
of uh, spiritual gifts, these miraculous gifts, that when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part, these spiritual gifts will be done, be done away with. Chapter 14 deals with how these spiritual gifts are to be used. Well, in this section of Scripture, he talks about uh, love. Notice in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. He said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that even if we were, and we're talking about speaking in tongues, we're not talking about some chaotic utterance. We're talking about a, a, a legitimate language. That's very clear there in Acts chapter 2. And so what Peter, Paul is saying here is, even if you had the ability to teach in every tongue of man, and, and even as angels are superior to men, you are able to converse and speak in the language of angels. If you do not have love, you're nothing. He said, if you, if you had all faith that you could remove mountains, but you don't have love, uh, you're nothing. And he also says there in, in chapter 13, that if you have all understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and, and uh, uh, if you don't have faith, if you don't have agape love, he says you're nothing. All times, agape, agape, agape. If you do not have agape, you're nothing. If you don't have this kind of love, you are a spiritual zero. You look at all those things that he says in, in verses 1, 2, and 3, those are mighty uh, achievements, great accomplishments. They said, if you don't have agape, you're nothing. You're a zero. Love business is an important business, just as surely as fish swim and birds fly, the Christian loves. What is agape love? Some folks feel that, that love is that warm, smiling, hugging sort of feeling. And that's due to the poverty-stricken English language. That's what the, most people think of when they think of love. And we like warmth. We love hugs and, 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 and smiles. But we understand, we have to understand that this is not the basic nature of agape. Many people are shocked when they learn that agape does not mean affection. Agape does not mean affection. It is known only by the action it prompts. So as we said before, agape is the love we are commanded to have. This is the, the, the com commanded love. When Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, this is agape. A mental decision. Do I choose to obey or do I choose not to obey? That's agape. Every time we have a direct command to love, it's agape. That's the reason why it's used, what, over 250 times. Perhaps the best definition of agape may very well be just the golden rule. And I know it's not in Scripture as the golden rule. That's what we commonly refer to it. Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You want a definition of agape? That's as good as any. The golden rule, Matthew 7, verse 12. When you try to define agape, agape seeks the highest good. Agape seeks only good will, desires only good will toward another. So agape desires good for another, whether they deserve it or not. Agape is you're desiring their highest good, good will, whether they deserve it or not. Feelings and emotions, they come and go. But agape remains. Agape remains because it's a mental decision. 
some examples, those parents who really love their children. They're going to seek their highest good, even when they may be disappointed with them and frustrated with them, maybe even when positive emotional feelings are hard to come by for them. You're always going to seek their highest good. That's a cape. And, and when they, they seek their, their children's highest good, when they're sassy, when they're disobedient, they're going to seek their highest good when they're dirty and smelly. Why? Because, brethren and friends, that's agape. Agape love never focuses on one's self. It is the giving love. Agape is the giving love. Its meaning is found not in possessing it, but in giving it. What is John chapter 3, verse 16? For God so loved. What is that? That's agape. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him shall perish but have everlasting life. In Ephesians 5 verse 25, when it talk, talks about Christ and the church, he loved the church and gave himself. That's agape. He loved the church and what? Gave himself for her. Agape is the giving love. So agape acknowledges and, and, and tries to fulfill the need of, of the one love. When you think about agape, it forgives and it forgets the failures of others. That's agape. Now, quickly, we're going to, we spent most of the time with agape. Why? Because the New Testament spent most of the time with agape. But what about phileo? Phileo is used approximately 20 times in the New Testament. Approximately 20 times. That's the friendship love. Phileo is the friendship love. It means affection. It, it, it's the love that, that grows with an appreciation of the person. It's interesting to note phileo is, is, is never a direct command. It's, it's encouraged. It's strongly encouraged. You see that throughout Scripture. And, and, and often, as, again, it's only used about 20 times there in the New Testament. It's strongly encouraged. It's never a direct command. And the best definition I know of phileo is to delight, to be in the presence of. That's phileo. To delight, to be in the presence of. Paul used this word in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 when he said the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. What is he saying? To delight... To be in the presence of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money in and of itself is neither good nor bad. But to delight to be in the presence of money, that's the root of all kinds of evil. We are encouraged to, to phileo, encouraged to delight to be in the pre presence of right things, of good things. To let our love for these things surface and be expressed. What about eros? Eros is, is the romantic love. Eros is, is, is the romantic love. And, and the word eros does not appear in the New Testament. It does not appear. That's probably because by New Testament time it became attached and associated with lust rather than love. But the fact that it's not uh, uh, there in Scripture, it, it's, it's still in, in Scripture. It's not, it's not specifically not found in Scripture, in the New Testament that is, but it is uh, indicated in Scripture uh, throughout. In the in Hebrew Old Testament, in Proverbs 7, verse 18, it says, Come, let us take our fill of love until morning, and let us delight ourselves with love. Romantic love. Eros, that's the theme of the Song of Solomon. Eros. Again, though it doesn't appear here in the New Testament, it doesn't mean that romantic love is not included. It's just not discussed. And then what about storge, fourth word, storge? That's the family love. That refers to family love. This is the love that flows naturally uh, among those within the family circle. 
Uh, it refers to the natural family bond, like mother and child. Uh, it goes much broader to include aunts and uncles and cousins and things of that nature. Uh, very, very powerful force forward. I, one preacher made this comment. He said, have you ever been to a family reunion where someone began talking about Democrats and Republicans? Before long, the whole family was mad. Everybody was left saying, I won't be back next year. And the following year, what happens? Everybody's back again. That's storge. That's family love. That's that natural bond uh, among family members. We'll close that portion of our study. I want to give a couple more thoughts to agape. Agape love, that's the characteristic word. It's the characteristic word of Christianity, and it's known from the actions that it prompts. And when you think about agape, it had its perfect expression in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The perfect expression of agape. He always showed intense love and concern and passion uh, for others by his actions. Remember what 1 John 3, I think 18, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't just verbally express your love, but demonstrate it. Show it. Jesus showed his love by his actions. We express our love toward God by explicit obedience, by our actions. Obedience to the will. We show our love by what we do. John 14, 15. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. There's something you must do. Verse 21 of John 14. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Verse 23 of the same book and chapter. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then in, in verse 24 of the same book and chapter. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The self-willed self-pleasing person shows the very opposite of love for God. And if we only do those things that delight us, then there's no way we can practice agape. See, agape is seeking the highest good, desiring only goodwill, whether that person deserves it or not. When we think about agape as the giving love, the action love, we need to remember great scriptures like Romans 13.10 where it says, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. We'll share a few examples. You know, there are times when we don't feel like worshiping God. Oftentimes we come across individuals, I don't feel good. I, don't, I just want to stay in. There'll be times when you don't feel like worshiping God, but you're going to worship Him if you agape Him. There are times when we won't want to go to the hospital and sit with a friend who's dying. It's not pleasant. It's not something we enjoy. But if we agape that individual, we're going to do it. We're not going to have any delight in it. We may not feel like doing it. There may not be any pleasure in it, but our love for that person is going to drive us to do it. There are going to be times when we won't feel like doing something God has asked us to do. But if agape for God is present, we're not going to allow anything to prevent us from doing it. And there'll be times when husband and wife, they may want to choke each other, or so Heather says. But if they agape one another, they're going to treat each other like they want to be treated. Back to Matthew 7, verse 12. There's a, there is so much depth, so much richness to each of the terms that we read in Scripture. The Koine Greek is a beautiful language, and there are so many lessons to be learned just by investing time in word studies. But I think we can already see very clearly how poverty-stricken our English language is, especially when it comes to the word love. I think I'm going to say this next week. I'm going to say it now. If I had a magic wand, I would just wipe out the word love from our English vocabulary and I'd replace it 
with the, the way the Koine Greek expresses love so that we can be more clear in what, what it is that we're saying when we use the word love. It's time we extend the invitation to those in this assembly. Brethren and friends, if you have a need of any kind, perhaps there are some here who have not yet put on Christ in baptism. We want you to know that opportunity is available to you. And maybe you have put on Christ in baptism, but you strayed from the faith. We want you to know we, we, we plead with you to repent, confess, and, and, and be restored before it's everlasting too late. Brethren and friends, if you have a need of any kind, we encourage you to come forward as together we stand and together we sing. sing the first and last verse and then we'll have a closing prayer with any announcements we need to make. Don't forget we, we meet again next Sunday. Is that right? Okay. And hopefully just be safe. Stay off the ice and play in the snow if, if, we, if we get it. Angry words of
Lord God in heaven, what a pleasure, what a tremendous blessing to have been in your presence. And Father, we pray that we have truly worshipped you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that we might grow in our agape love for you and our agape love for our Lord and Savior Jesus and our agape love, Father, for one another and our agape love for those that are our enemies. Father, we're just grateful that we have the privilege and the blessing of being your children. And we pray, Father, that you will help us always to realize the importance of being the salt to this earth and the light to this dark world. That we might be the influence that we need to be on the lives of others. Because again, Father, we agape them. Please be with us now, Father, as we leave this place this morning. We pray for your protection always, and that we might always be the people you want us to be. We pray through Christ. Amen.